Sarabonim, Rabbi Kalamar, Rabbi Pearl, Rabbi Vernon, Rabbi Lieberman, Rabbi Sonniker, Rabbi Galler, Kantha Rosner, all of you are here this evening. Special guest Yossi Bamel is here this evening. Members of the committee who worked so hard to put this memorial together. We are gathered here this evening to remember and to learn about three Kedoshim, holy young boys, our boys, Eyal, Gilad, and Aftali, Eyal, Ben, Uriel, and Iris, Chura, Yifrach, Yaakov, Naftali, Ben, Avraham, the Rachel, Dvora, Frankel, and Gilad, Michael, Ben, Ophir, Ubat, Galim, Sha'er who were murdered by Palestinian terrorists, Yamach Shimon Bezichram, approximately six weeks ago, and were found buried in the desert near Hebron just 30 days ago. We join the boys' parents and grandparents and brothers and sisters and family and friends, the communities where they grew up 
in Elad and Talmon and Nophi alone, the people of Israel and Jews all over the world in mourning the loss of three pure, innocent, beautiful, holy young men whose, de whose death has brought the Jewish people together in a way possibly not experienced since the victory of the Six Day War in 1967. Before I introduce our guest speakers, two friends of the boys who flew in specially to address us this evening from Israel, permit me to share with you a Torah thought that puts this evening's program and memorial in perspective. The Talmud teaches us that if a person has fulfilled a mitzvah, let's say, for example, a person made Kiddush on Friday night, a personal obligation, I made Kiddush, and now someone comes into my house and they haven't made Kiddush yet. Even though I fulfilled my mitzvah, I can make Kiddush again for that individual. If I wanted to make Kiddush a second time for myself, I can't make it a second time. That would be an unnecessary bracha. But if I want to make Kiddush for this individual who hasn't made Kiddush yet, so the halacha is, the Talmud tells us, Afal pi motzi. Even though I fulfilled my personal obligation, I can make Kiddush again for that individual. It's not an unnecessary bracha for the other Jew. The question is why? Why can I make the bracha for this other person? It's not because it's a good deed to assist my friend, my relative, my neighbor to fulfill a mitzvah. That's not the reason. It's not a chesed. The reason, as explained by our sages, is kol Yisrael arevim zelazeh. Each of us is responsible for one another. And the commentators explain that the concept that each of us is responsible for one another represents a form of achtos, of unity, that is much deeper and something that the world generally doesn't understand. What does it mean, this kind of achtos? Because call Yisrael a raven, properly understood means not just that I should look out for another Jew, that I should care about them and assume, and assume certain duties towards them. It means if another Jew has not performed a mitzvah, it means that I haven't performed the mitzvah. Even if I have, it's ki'ilu, it's ki'ilu, it's as if I didn't do the mitzvah. If I am Shomer Shabbos, but another Jew isn't observing Shabbos, it's ki'ilu, I haven't observed Shabbos. If I made Kiddush, but you didn't, it's ki'ilu. It's as if I haven't made Kiddush. If I have something, if I have a possession, but another Jew is lacking, is missing out, it's ki'ilu, everything I have, I don't have it either, despite the fact that I, that I think that I have it. Because the Jewish people aren't just a group of individuals joined together creating a nation. We are, in fact, one guf, one body, and one neshama, one soul. And that provides the philosophical backdrop for this evening's memorial service. Six weeks ago, we learned that our boys were taken captive by terrorists. 
And when we heard about it, the immediate reaction for all of us was, how can this happen to our boys? Not their boys, but our boys. When Gilad whispered into the telephone, they kidnapped me a little bit inside every single one of us felt as if we had been taken captive. And when the boy screamed, a little bit of our souls, of our neshamas, screamed as well. And we, when we learned, Rahman al that they were murdered, a little bit of each and every one of us perished in the mountains near Hebron. We cannot forget what brought all of us here together this evening, and that is that the loss of Eyal, Gilad, and Naphtali is not simply a loss for their parents and grandparents and families for their communities. It's not simply a loss for the people of the state of Israel, but it is a loss that each and every one of us feels intimately. It's our personal loss, and we are all Avelim, mourners, as a result. This evening's two guest speakers are Mickey Zivan and David Tarragon. Mickey is 20 years old. He was born in New York and has four brothers. Two of his brothers are married. One of them, his uh, second brother, is fighting in Gaza right now. His family moved to Chashmonoyim when he was in eighth grade. Uh, he was born in New York, and he, they lived in Rochester. They moved to Chashmonoyim. Mickey attended Yeshivat Ner Tamid for high school, where he was active in the Bnei Akiva movement. And he also volunteered for Kavla Chaim, an organization that helps people who are disabled, children with disabilities. After graduating high school, Mickey opted to push off his army service to study the famous yeshiva in Hebron, Yeshivat Shavei Hebron, where he met his roommate, who was none other than Ayal Yifrach, Hashem Yinakem Damav. Our other guest speaker is David Tarragon, whose father is well known to many of us because he's a, a Ram in Yeshivat Haaretz Yon, but whose mother should also be well known to many of you because she attended the Hebrew Academy of Nassau County for elementary school and grew up in West Hempstead. David is in the 11th grade in Yeshivat Mekor Chaim, which is located in Kfar Etzion. Yeshiva Mekor Chaim is um, the yeshiva that's connected very much to the noted Talmud Chacham and philosopher and author Rav Adin Steinzaltz and which was the yeshiva that was attended by his friends, Naftali and Gilad, Hashem Yenakem Damam. During the two weeks that uh, people were searching for the three boys when they were missing, David was interviewed over 20 times by various media outlets. On behalf of all of us, we want to thank each of you for attending and speaking with us this evening, to speak about your friends, it can't be easy. Tehei nishmotzeim tzurim b'tzor hachayim, may their souls be bound in the bonds of eternal life. I want to invite David to address us first. Okay, um, first of all, I really just uh, want to thank you all for coming, 
because the story was so special to see how much this story in Naftali, Gilad, and Eyal really went into the hearts of all of us, in, the Jews in all, the all over the world and in Israel. And it was very, very special for us, and that's really what, what, what made us be able to stand on our feet and to be active in this time, to feel the, to feel the hug of all Am Israel. So before I speak, I really want to just say thank you to all of you. So, First, I want to talk a little bit about my yeshiva, Yeshivat Makor Chaim, which is a very, very special yeshiva. So it's considered a yeshiva tichonit, which means that you have a Torah studies in the morning, and then you learn secular studies. The secular studies are on a very, very high level, and it's a very, very special thing. Another very special thing about my yeshiva is that many, many different types of people from all over I mean, Israel, people come from the north and from the south, Tzafon Darom, and really, it's, and, uh, people are very, very different. So it's very, very nice to see. Also, you can see in Gilad Naftali that they came from, I think, an hour and a half from our yeshiva. People are very, very different, and you get to learn so much from each person. Another special thing about our yeshiva is the special, special connection we have with our teachers. Actually, um, when we heard that they were, when Gilad Naftali were murdered or when they were captured by the Palestinians, so it was amazing to see how much the first people to really burst in tears and be with us in this part were the teachers, no matter if it was the teachers that knew Gilad and Naftali or the teachers that didn't know them so well, but the teacher was so much with us and so much with us in that pain that was very, very special. Another thing in our yeshiva that is very, very special is the open speech. It's something that our yeshiva started with the, the Rav Dov Zinger, our Rosh Yeshiva which is when we sit in a circle, it's called a blitz in Hebrew, without sarcasm. When we sit in a circle and each one just points to someone and says something from his heart. Like, no matter what you want to say, just to be honest and to say something from your heart, which is very, very special from this time when we had so many emotions and so many thoughts in our head that was just nice to speak from our heart in this time. Last thing I want to say about the yeshiva before I start to talk about Gilan Naftali, was another very, very special thing about our yeshiva is the shira and the nigun, the singing. We were considered a yeshiva chasidit, a chasidish yeshiva. And it's very, very special, all this shira and nigun. And I would even, if, uh, if we have time, I would like really much to teach you a very special nigun that was with us during the, this time, this very hard time. So I would like to start to speak first about Gilad. Gilad was a very, very, very special kid. So first of all, what that was very, very special about him was his happiness in life. I feel like I personally have to sometimes work on my happiness and sometimes be happier. And Gilad, it was so natural for him. Gilad was always just with a smile on his face. I can't imagine him without a smile because he was just always with a smile. And he was always making people happy and making, and making, and making people laugh. So one of the things that I want to tell you about is this story. Gilad had a fish tank in his room. And every couple, couple of weeks, he used to buy a new uh, goldfish for his fish tank. So we decide one day in our grade that we have to decide who's going to be the grandfather of all the goldfish. Gilad decided, so we all were there. We all attended. And the, fish, the, the goldfish that was biggest in size was chosen to be the grandfather. We called him Niso. So we made a huge party, and Gilad made for him a cake, and it was very, very exciting. And sadly, uh, Niso passed away two weeks later. And so it, we said Teilim, and Gilad wrote this dramatic spit for Niso. And it was, it was so Gilad just to always be happy and always just be with us and to always make everyone laugh in every day. Another special thing about Gilad was how caring he was and how much he was giving to the Chivra, to the people, to his peers and the people surrounding him. He was a Madrich in Bnei Akiva, and he was all the time just giving and thinking how to... Uh, make the peulot, the peulot are the activities he does with his chanichim, with his uh, kids in Bnei Akiva. So he was all the time thinking how to make it better and how much to do more and how to be more um, active in Bnei Akiva. And it was very special about him. Another thing is that I actually, just only after he was kidnapped, I realized this, I went into his room and I saw next to his bed, he had this big, big, um, uh, big luach um, of the year with all, I forgot what I said. Anyway, this, with all the days of the year, and every day he had someone that has a birthday, like all his friends and all his family, he had their birthday dates. 
so you can remember how to say to them happy birthday. He was very, very king in that way. Another thing that was very special about him, in this caring way, there's a story that in Israel there's this rabbanit, this rabbi called Rabbanit Yemima Mizrahi, which is this um, rabbanit that has this gathering for women in Israel. So in this gathering, she speaks a little bit and people say stories. So one of the stories is one of the women that, were, that attended this gathering stood up and had that story about Gilad. So in Israel, there are these types of uh, after-school programs for our kids that have problems at home or in school or studying. So in one of this after, in, in this after-school program that she was a teacher at, one of the kids was Gilad. So in the beginning, she tried to find out what, what was his problem because he looked, he looked so friendly and he was doing well in his school. So she didn't understand. So after a half a year that she wasn't able to find out what, 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 what was he problematic at, so she went over to Gilad and took him to the side and said, why are you here? It feels like you're really wasting your time here. You're, you're such a special kid. And he said that he has a new kid in, in his school. And this kid goes also to this after, after school program. And uh, this kid felt really bad and was talking with Gilad about how like, he feels bad with himself, that he's a problematic kid and that he has to go to this after school program. So Gilad told him, don't worry, I, uh, it's normal. Uh, everyone goes, I even go to this after school program. So we, and he's, this is when Gilad was 10 years old. He was already so caring that for a year he went to this after school program just so this kid won't feel bad. And it shows so much of the giving of Gilad and that his giving was in such a quiet way. Like so many stories I just heard about him only after he passed away or after he was kidnapped because he, was, he, was, he always did his good deeds in such a quiet way so no one would know and to always help others. Another special thing about Gilad he was always organized and always neat. So they, a lot of times there is stigma, which means a lot of people say about Makochnikim, kids that learn in Makochayim, that they're not neat and they don't shower a lot, but Gilad was totally not like this. <laughs> Gilad, is after, I went to his room, his bed is always made, his, his, everything's always neat. His handwriting was really, really neat, that we used to laugh at him all the time when Gilad used to make posters for Makor Chaim. So on the bottom of the poster, we used to write uh, Ulpinat Makor Chaim. So to all of you that don't know, Ulpina is a girl's school. So we used to laugh at him that he has a girl handwriting. Another thing about Gilad is that he never, never, never gave up. He was always doing everything until the self. He was very, very, he was always determined to do everything until the end and to believe that there's always a way. So we have in our yeshiva, this thing that we make the, the 11th graders do for the whole yeshiva, this I mean, four days in the middle of the year that we go to the woods and we organize everything from the sleeping and the food and the, and the buses. So one of the things we organized was this type of game called Hatewufon in English, insanity. If that, if that. Anyway, so it, with a lot of games and missions and, no matter, and teams. So one of the things that we want to make, we want to make this huge slingshot that with huge rubber bands that we want to tie to two sides of a, of a soccer goal. Like this huge, huge slingshot. And uh, two, two of the teams shoot water balloons one at the other. So we tried to work on this. We were really, really working for hours and hours on the slingshot and it just didn't work. So we all decided to give up because after all we had a lot of games and so we can give up on the slingshot. So Gilad said, no, we can't give up on this thing. And he took it upon himself. After an hour, he, he came back with a slingshot, which was working perfectly. And no one knows how he did. He just, he, Gilad, he never gives up. And another thing that shows how much he didn't give up, and it, this is more in the Wuhani, in the more spiritual level, in Limud Torah. When he was learning, so he always, it was very, very important for him that when he was learning to understand everything until the end, every single line, he won't continue to the next line until he understood this line perfectly. But not only to understand what the, the meaning, but to also understand the deeper meaning of what it is. So I was learning with him on Shavuot, and we were learning about the Khuban Abayit. And there's this Gemara that says that the Khuban was because of the, they, didn't say, they didn't say a bracha of a Birkat Torah before they were learning. So it's very, very important for him to, te, to show me how, how important it is to understand that the Torah is part of us. And it, it's supposed to talk to us and be a, really a part of us, not like any other text that we learn, like math or history. It's really much part of us and such a holy thing that was, and because of that, it was enough for a just to get to this understanding. And that's the reason why we have to 
and do Birkot Torah before we learn to, that we should understand how important this thing is and how part of us the Torah is. So before, before I speak about, a little bit about Naftali, I would like to just say that I'm trying to describe Gilad and Naftali before you in the next few minutes, but really I'm, I'm sure it's about every single one in, in, and especially these types of people like Gilad and Naftali, no matter how many words I say, no matter how, many, how much I try to describe them, you, you can't get close to who these people were because the, the best way to describe Gilad is to say that he was Gilad. And the best way to describe Naftali is to say that he was Naftali. And more than that is, I'm not going to say an insult, but it's just not, it's not it. But I just, by, by knowing them in a personal level, you can see how amazing these people are and how wonderful they are and how, how much beautiful neshamot they have. And just I want to, you to know that. Anyway, I would like to start to talk about Naftali. So one thing about Naftali is that he was very, very sharp and smart. In a, in, well, I, will, I was a chavuta of him a little bit time in Limud Gemara. We learned Gemara together. And it was a little annoying because before, before I even started to, to open the page, he was already starting to ask questions and answer. And so it was a little annoying to learn with him because he was just so smart and he totally was into it already on the first minute. And he was also a very, very good ch chess player. He was, he was always uh, winning in chess. He was a, a very good athletic. He was always... I mean, if you wanted to play basketball, you always knew to call uh, Naftali. There's, uh, he was always there. So, and what was very, very special about him in these games, he was, he was very uh, competitive, but he was very, very determined. So it was known that Naftali always wins, no matter what he does. If it's a basketball game, if it's chess, even if it's rock, paper, scissors, Naftali would win. <laughs> And no one knew how he did it actually in this Teufon, this insanity game that I told you about. So he was a captain of this team. And it was a seven hour game and like an hour before the end. So he was last place and he, they really started to give up. And somehow, somehow out of the blue, they were second place. So no one understand how it was, but it was Naftali's team. So everyone understood somehow that that's what happened. Actually, a week before they were kidnapped. So I had a basketball game with him, with Naftali. And in the beginning, I liked to play very calm, and he right away was very violent and very much determined to win on the beginning. So I was on him, and after the game, I was full of wounds all over my body. I was <laughs> cuts and wounds, because that was just uh, Naftali, always determined. So it was amazing in basketball, ping pong, and volleyball, always just the best, and it was really amazing. So another special thing about Naftali is he was very, very much connected to his family. He was all the time talking about his family and how amazing people they are. So unfortunately, we got to know his family through the, in these few weeks. And you can see how amazing people they are and how wonderful they are. And now I can see from where, where it came from. But it was very, very important for him to speak about these things. And I think it's important for all of us just to be a little, maybe a little closer to our families. And anyway, another special thing about him is he was very, very idealist. He was idealistic. All the time when you have a discussion with him or an argument, he was always choosing the right thing and not the easier thing. He was always very, very important for him. And he always also had this uh, self-confidence. He, he had a lot of self-confidence. When you are in an argument with him, it is as if he said, saying to you, listen, I know that I'm right, now I just have to convince you of that. Because you can't argue with Naftali. When you go to an argument with Naftali, it's to hear what he has to say and not to tell him anything. It was very, very nice about him. Anyway, I, my sister, another thing about Naftali before I go to the next thing is he was very, very, he, was, he had this very, very good sense of music. He used to play guitar and uh, the flute. I used to actually go a few nights to his room and play with him guitar and into the night a few hours, which was very, very special. But one of the funny things that he was able to do, it was he used to put two flutes into his mouth at once and do like a kol rishon kol cheni, like to play while he does the introduction and go into together and like uh, make this harm, harmonize both of the flutes together, which was amazing at once. So it was very, very special about him. Anyway, I, my sister was uh, very close to Eyal as well. As, and after speaking to her a little bit, I found out there was, there was something very, very special also about Gilan, Naftali and Eyal, something very connected about three of them. So they were all very, very idealist, idealistic and serious and determined. But as well, they were also very giving and very nice people to be with and very happy people. So I think this is a very, very special thing that 
a lot of times there are these serious idealistic people that are just n not nice to be next to. And, not, and there's the opposite, these nice people that are just not very serious, but they were very, very serious, very idealistic, but also giving and happy and nice people, which we can all learn from that. So I would like to speak a little bit about the 18 days in our yeshiva. It was a very, very special time, and I feel like I want to tell you a little bit about that. So one of the hardest things when we heard that they were kidnapped is that even when a person dies, it's a very, very hard position to be at, especially when you're close to these people, to a person. But at least there's this track, this, the way that you know what you're supposed to do. There's the Levaya and then the Shloshim, and then the, the Shiva, the, the, the Shloshim. The Chamim gave us a way and a lifestyle that you're supposed to do after a person passes away. The hard thing about this thing is that we just didn't know what to do. What are you supposed to do in this type of position? You're, Kids are kidnapped, your friends are kidnapped, and you don't know to start spedim, to start to talk about them, or is that too dramatic, to be optimistic, not to be too optimistic. It was very, very hard. And everyone was very confused, and everyone had like this mix of emotions in their head. A second, one second you could be very, very uh, angry, or then a sadden, and just to be in shock. It was very, very hard. And uh, we had many, many uh, psychologists in our yeshiva, they came and the most important for them to tell us was that every single reaction to this, to this thing is legitimate. If a person wanted to just not be part of this, it's fine, it's legitimate because it's very, very hard to be a part of this. And if someone wants to be in shock, that's also legitimate. So my, uh, my reaction to this was, first of all, it, this happened in a, in a Thursday night. And, and it was when I was, so we had Thursday night in our yeshiva, we go home. So I was at home for a Thursday night, uh, Friday morning in Shabbos, and the whole time I was just waiting to be back in yeshiva. I was, I was crying a lot, I was very in shock, but I just wanted to be with the people that understood what I was going through, or somehow what I was going through. It was very, very special. Just to go to yeshiva, you felt this type of relief of, I'm with people that, that, are, that are going through what I'm going through. So it was very, very special to just be in yeshiva. So, and then I went into this type of, I was, it was very, very important for me to always be active, to run and speak with these people and to be interviewed and to just, and to, to just do, to always, always be active just so I didn't know how it would be to sit down and think about them and what might go into my head. So it was very, very important for me to be active. And I think it's very, very important to be in this type of active mood, and especially in these times, because in these times, so suddenly, many, many opportunities that otherwise, if you weren't going to go through these hard times or this crisis, you weren't going to be open for you. So there's actually this pasuk in Tehilim, which means in hard times, Hashem suddenly opens in front of you and He opens so many opportunities and so many things that you can do. So the Rav Dov, Rav Dov Zinger, our Rosh Hashiva, when he came home one night, so his wife asked him, how was your day in Yeshiva? So he said, what day are you talking about? I lived two months this day in yeshiva. Because, also because of the mix of uh, emotions and the change of emotions, but also because of the amount of opportunities and the amount of things that we were able to do. I can give myself for an example that I, uh, a month and a half ago, no, no one really cared what I had to say. I was this normal high school boy. Now in Israel, I'm suddenly all of the media is ru running after me. Suddenly I'm invited to here to speak in front of, I don't know how many people, but a lot of people. <laughs> And it, this is so amazing, and I feel like it's... And we had this, uh, this gathering of our, of our machzor, of our great in yeshiva, that we all were supposed to talk about ourselves. So this was like, like a belief, I said before, and to speak from our hearts and tell you what we have. And for our, our counselor in yeshiva, what well, was very, very important for him to tell us that Hashem doesn't do anything without a reason. And there's also a reason that we were chosen for this thing, and we have a role now. So we have to take this role upon ourselves. How, no matter how hard it is, it's very important that we take our role and be active and be part of this. Uh, last story I want to say about this whole being a part of and active is we had this, uh, there's this person in Tel Aviv that has a cancer. And before he went to isolation, he, he, he had this one wish before he goes, went to isolation. It was very, very important for us to meet our grade. So we, we don't understand what, what does he have to get from us. So I went to this thing. And first of all, it was very, very important for, uh, for him to tell us how much, how strong we are and how much we, we're giving our strength to all of Am Yisrael and just want to be a part of it. But second of all, it was very, very important for him to give, to tell us this. He was this Chiloni person. 
he told us that when, when you go through hard times, when he, he felt it in a personal level, when you go through hard times, suddenly Hashem opens in front of you so many options. And it's going to be, and it's just, your role is to take these options and to be active. So it's very, very important for us. So actually one of the things that we were very active at was meeting the families. We, we went to Mishpachat Frenkel and Mishpachat Shair. So I went about three or four times to Mishpachat Frenkel. And the first thing I wanted to say was his mother is just such an amazing and strong person. To see a person going through this is re really amazing. But w when I spoke with his father, after I spoke with his mother, was, uh, I spoke with him uh, alone for a few minutes. And what that was very, very important for him to tell us is a message for our yeshiva and to just everyone. So he, he said that he knows that the, the IDF and the army are doing all they can on the practical side. And he knows that all the diplomatics and politicians are doing all they can on the diplomatic side. But it's very, very important for him that the right people will do all they can on the spiritual side. And as the T people, we, we believe that the spiritual side is such an important and part of this whole story and it was very, very important for us. So this was the main part that our yeshiva took upon itself in this hard time, which was the spiritual side. So first of all, it was Tfilot and Imut Torah. Actually, the Rav Dov said to us a lot he, in, the, in this gathering, he said that the, the, the main point of the Palestinian Mechablim in this whole thing is he said they don't gain anything from it because really what is happening in Aza, they're not, they're not winning in this. They're not gaining any uh, practical thing in this, in this kidnapping. But what is very, very important for them is that w to weaken us and to make us afraid, to make us walk in Eretz Israel, and for maybe one second to be afraid and to think maybe, maybe not all of Eretz Israel is ours. It was very, very important for him that in this time when our enemies are trying to weaken us, it's very, very important to do exactly the opposite, to be stronger. And it really means in everything we do. If it's in davening, so we should be stronger in davening, and we should have more kavana. And if it's in imut Torah, we should learn Torah the best we can. And even if it's in nigun, or even if it's in happiness, no matter how hard it is, they want to weaken us, and we should be in this, these hard times, it's exactly the opposite from what you feel is being happy. But you have to be happy, and you have to be stronger to just so you can be part of this war. So another very important thing in the spiritual side is the achdut in, in Am Israel, which was very, very, I'm sure you all sensed it in this time. So at first, the Rav Dov, our Rosh Yeshiva, closed the doors of the Yeshiva and said, we want to be alone in this time, we want to daven, we want to learn Torah, but we don't want to be part of this whole huge thing in the Naft in, uh, Yaakov, Naftali, Ben Rachel, uh, um, uh, Gilad, Michael. We, we want to know them as Shair and Frenkel, our personal, and to feel in a more personal way. But after he saw how many people came to, to just to donate to our yeshiva, and, to just, and many people just came to just to, to hug us and to be with us there, and to see how many letters we got from all over Eretz Israel and from all over the world, just to be with us and to be part of us, so he, he understood how important it is, this achdut how important it is that we would be part of it. So we believe that also the Sakhdut is part of this whole spiritual level that our yeshiva has to take upon itself. So first of all, in the Sakhdut level, we, we went to Tel Aviv and Yerushalayim and to places with a lot of people and we gave out Sifre Teilim to say with Chironim. And it was amazing, amazing to see. I don't think there was, when I stood there, I don't think there was one person that didn't stop. Just everyone, every single person that, stopped, that passed by stopped to say for 10, 15 minutes to lean with us, and it was really amazing. And actually, I, uh, while I was standing there, so these uh, 20 chiloniot, uh, non-religious girls came over to me, and they said, Takshiv, anachnu lo ma'aminot ba'ashem, avachnu rutsin l'argish chilek me'asipur hazeh. We don't believe in Hashem, but it's, we're gonna, it's very, very important for us to feel part of the story and to feel whatever you're feeling. So it's important for us to say Tehillim with you. So that was really the feeling of all Am Yisrael in this time, just to feel part of it. Everyone just wanted to be inside this story. And I also saw in, in America many videos of the Tefillot that you had here. And it was very, very special how everyone just wanted to be a part of it. And it was really amazing. So we also went with a lot of uh, meeting with Chironim and, and uh, these huge things in the Kotel and in Kikar Rabin with thousands and thousands of people that just came to be with us, which was really amazing. So my personal side in this whole time was I was uh, chosen to be a type of a spokesperson for our yeshiva. So I've been uh, interviewed a lot and I had uh, this, these meetings with politicians. 
So one of the interesting meetings I had was with two politicians, one from Habayit Ayudi and one from Im Ha'avodah, which is one from the right wing and one from the left. And if you're going to see them together, it's going to be only on television, uh, screaming and cursing each other. But now they were, they were with us. They were just there to, just because it was, it's very, very important to see how we all have our different opinions and our differences. But the one thing that is stronger than any of our opinions is our love and our caring for Am Yisrael. So these people, no matter how different they are from us and how much their beliefs are different, this, everyone has this neshama of Am Yisrael inside of them and they all feel this strong feeling. So it's very, very special. So another very special thing for, for me in, this, in being interviewed was that people would see us in a different way because a lot of times there are these people in Israel called Noor Gvaot, which is these uh, very radical um, uh, people that come from the Datili uh, community, which are people that do these huge protests and uh, burn Arab houses, and they're very, very radical. So many people are scared to speak with the Datili Umi community or be a part of it because that they see these radical people and they don't want to be part of it. So it's very important for, for us, to, for me personally, to show how we're not like that and how much how much we're, we're special and how much, and I also learned how special the Chilonim are and how special the Haredim are in this whole time. And I actually got many, many, many letters afterwards from a lot, a lot of people that wrote for me that they saw my interview and how that it just changed for them something. You know? How much they got to this new understanding of how, and how much they want to be a part of us and not to, not to be the Tilumi, but to, to meet us and to, fe to feel whatever we're feeling and to be with us. And I think it's sad that only in these times we suddenly wake up and we suddenly realize that, that we're part of something so amazing called Am Israel. And suddenly people feel this amazing feeling. And I think we can all just try to feel in every day. In, actually in the Levaya, so Harav Dov Zinger, he stood up and he said that we should all take upon ourselves before davening to do the kavanot of uh, this bracha of uh, loving Am Israel. We should all just say before tefillah, I forgot how the bracha goes. But just to, to feel this love for Am Yisrael, no matter what opinions we have, to just feel it. So it's very, very important. So I would like to just to speak a little bit about the Ptira. So when, when we heard about this, that they were murdered and not only kidnapped, so it was very, very hard for us. And of course, we went again through this whole a mix of emotions, and it was very, very hard. And we all just ran straight to our yeshiva because that was the, really the only place we can really feel, feel the amazing feeling of our yeshiva and the hug of our friends and our teachers. So it's very important for us. So, and between all of these feelings, so there's this one feeling that at first I felt a little guilty for feeling, but towards I realized that's a really true feeling, which was a little bit of a relief. Because after all, First of all, the, the unknown was so hard for so many people and all over the world people were, were not able to sleep because of just not knowing what was happening with them. And I, to imagine what the families were going through of just not knowing and just trying to imagine the worst case scenario and it was very, very hard for people. It was very, very nice to know that we suddenly, it, even though it was a hard, hard thing to know, but we, we knew that we knew what was happening. And the second of all, this relief was because that we really know that in Baruch Hashem, they, were, they didn't have to go through all of these 18 days of suffering and it happened fast. I don't wanna, so between all of this sadness and depression, there was also a little bit of a relief. So also in the Levaya, so it was of course a very, very hard experience, but just to be there and surrounding you, you have 150,000 people from all of Israel people that didn't know them at all, just that came to be part of it, it was so, so amazing. And it was so special to know how many Zichuyot, Gilad, Naftali, and Eyal have for every Chiloni that said Tehillim for the first time in his life, or every Dati or I mean, Orthodox person that had more Kavana just because of this whole thing. So how many, and this whole Achdut in Am Yisrael, how many Zichuyot, Gilad, and Naftali have? So I just want to finish and say that as a, as the T people as believers and, and we really believe that and especially with people like these like this when they are taken from this world so some of the Kedusha of Hashem is taken with them that's also the reason why we we say Kaddish after someone passes away 
because we believe that people that do a lot of Kedusha in this world, when they're taking, so a little bit of this Kedusha is taken. So we want in Kaddish to somehow fill in this Kedusha. So I think it's very important that we all, especially with these types of people, take some of the Kedusha that they had and some of the Kedusha that they did in this world and to take it upon ourselves. If it's the happiness or the giving or, the, or just the Limud Torah, or the, to be more of an idealist, I think everyone, each and every one of us should just take upon ourselves a small part of the Kedusha of Gil'an and Naftali, or Eyal, which they're going to speak about in a moment, and just to take it upon himself to somehow try to fill in a little bit of this whole thing. And last of all, I want to just say again thank you, because really, that was what was really, that was what that picked us up, and that was what that was made us stand on our feet this whole time, the whole Am Israel that were there just to hug us and be with us, which was very, very special. And I, we also believe that all the tefillot, even though it's finished in, in the way that we didn't hope that the story would finish, we believe that the tefillot are not, didn't go to waste because now to live in Israel and to see how many nisim we live every single day, to hear all the stories that the Chayalim are saying, and to see, we believe that these, these, the, our tefillot are a very big part of it. So I want to really thank you so much for your tefillot this time and thank you so much for your caring and the fact that you let, and the fact to see so many people standing in the back, which I, I'm, it, it's not, I'm not happy to see people standing up, but just to see people that, just that, that there's not room because so many people just want to be a part of it and so many people just want to come and hear us. So thank you very, very, very much. to do with the guitar because, well, because of the three weeks, so I can't. But what was very, one of the very nice nigunim that was very close to Naftali's heart is Vitar Libenu. So I would like to teach you, and I would like to all try somehow to join because it's going to be very embarrassing for me to sing alone. <laughs> so and I would like to teach you this nigun. It's a very, very beautiful nigun. Actually, it was chosen to be kind of tragic because in our yeshiva, we had this kid called Yonatan Zuckerman, also a very, very special kid. And on the way to a Sheva Bachot of his sister, he got, I mean, a car rolled over him, so he passed away. And in his levaya, we didn't know what to do, of course. These teenage kids that just are standing in front of the death of their friend and just don't know what to do. So the only thing we had to really do was to sing. So we sang this nigun, and this became such a such a powerful nigun and such a part of us, so I want to teach you all. Okay, uh, once again, I have to choose the tone. Okay, I chose the wrong tone. Veta, veta, veta.
So I was thinking about before the other day what I'm supposed to, how I'm supposed to start speaking with everything that's going on, with a brother down south, with with friends, uh, another friend who lost his leg, and the countless amount of sawot that we're seeing. I'm thinking about what I'm supposed to say, and then my brother who's down south before he, I don't know where he was, which stage he was in, but he sent me a picture on WhatsApp of a uh, of a portable shawarma car that someone that someone brought down to feed the soldiers with a caption that said Am Yisrael Chai so Am Yisrael Chai and it's the only thing that those are only three words that could really explain what's going on and even with everything that's going on on the maybe on the bad side but Am Yisrael Chai and can't forget that so like David, um, I first have to say because from everything that David just said, I only knew Ayali Fakh and when people would ask me about the three boys, I, I really didn't have much to say. And thank you that now I have, uh, I feel like I know the Gilad and Aftari Gam. Shavir Chavon, the yeshiva that we learned, like we said before, is um, the yeshiva 
sits right in the heart of the Jewish um, settlement, uh, Jewish area of Chavon. For those who know, if you start in the Mount Machpelah and you make your way up towards Beit Hadassah, it's right there. The yeshiva is a yeshiva gvoa. It's not a hezda yeshiva. It's for yeshiva for guys who are coming out. Everyone who's there is after high school. Um, yeshiva gvoa means that um, guys can come for as long as they want to. There's no set time of how, how long you're going to be there. Guys come for two, three years, four years, and then go on to have to their army service. Um, we're talking about two, three years of someone's life, and then going on to another three, three years of, uh, of the army, and in most cases, or a lot of cases from the yeshiva's part, guys who go into uh, elite units, which is another four, which is maybe four years, if they're going to be an officer, five years, six years, so forth. And that's the, um, that's the type of guys that come through the yeshiva, and that's the type of reason. So for that type of guy, that type of mentality, I know that Ayar uh, Yifach came Another um, piece of why I got Shavich uh, was uh, we had another we had a boy, which now after David said his story, and now it's scary how sometimes the stories are so similar. We we had a boy a month before. Um, there was a boy Effie Ariel. Effie also came from. Um, the Yeshuv Elad, where, where Gilad came from. And uh, Effie is special in his own right. He was also killed in a car accident a month before Ayah. No, before Ayah came to the Yeshiva. It was actually Effie who really convinced Ayah to come check out the Yeshiva in the first place. He told him, like, I, I know where you are, you're, you're, in a, you're in a great place right now, but I think, I think this could be a place for you. So Ayal came to check out the yeshiva, and he was in my room when he when he just when he was checking out the yeshiva in the beginning of the year. So I asked him how long he's planning on being here. So he said, I'm, "It was like a Sunday." He said, "I'm here maybe that night, tomorrow morning. I'm out of here." To say the least, he left Motzi Shabbat, and I asked him why. And he said, "I wasn't gonna say that I'm gonna come learn here until I was for sure this is what I wanted." So he stayed the whole week until he was proven that this is what Ayah wanted. That's a little bit about who Ayah, in a short version, that's who he was. Someone who knows where he wants to go in life, what he's meant to do in life, and he's willing to do what it takes to get there. During 12th grade, um, Israeli boys have uh, an option for those who are qualified to do a year of Shalif. Shalif is a Sheministim Le Ayari Pituach. Sheministim are 12th graders who go to um, undeveloped communities and they spend their 12th grade year while everyone else, like like myself, we, we're doing, you know, Tiulim and we're, we're, it's usually it's a pretty fun year, 12th grade. Um, but um, I decided to go to Batyam. Batyam, for those who don't know, it's it's undeveloped, and there's what to work with in the, uh, in the youth, and that's how Ayah spent his 12th grade. While he was there, he was learning in a school that was mixed with um, religious and non-religious, because that's what they had, and he was realizing that when a non-religious boy had a bar mitzvah, so he would have a bar mitzvah, but there was no real the simcha, there was no, there was no real da uh, dancing, or, or there was dancing, but it wasn't the dancing that we know. So we organized the, the bar mitzvah project. So when everyone, anyone had a bar mitzvah, he would arrange that 20, 30 guys would go to the bar mitzvah and make sure there was, there was dancing, and there was simcha, like the way we know. When he first came to the yeshiva, in the beginning of Zman Kaitz, let's just say the Gemara wasn't his thing. Gemara, learning Gemara for anyone, in the beginning is not is not the easiest. So I asked so when his Rav, Rav Yaakov asked him like, Who are you? What's what's going on? Like, where'd you come from? It's the middle of the year. Usually we don't have guys come in the middle of the year. So 
She said, nah, it doesn't really matter who I am. He says, okay, well, where'd you come from? Mm, it doesn't matter really where I came from. So, okay, but what'd you do, where'd you learn? I didn't really learn so much in 12th grade. Who are you? So he said, I'm, I'm a yal, I'm a yaifa. So I said, okay, if, if there's anything I can help. So he said, he says, if you don't mind, I, I would like to sit next to you. So I yeah, sat next to Rav Yaakov. Rav Yaakov asked him in the first shir of Gemara, he said, so do, let's, let's go over, what, do you have any questions or anything? He says, I don't have any questions because I didn't understand a thing. <laughs> so I'm like, Needless to say, that Thursday, that very Thursday night, that very Thursday day, Thursday night when Ayah and Gilad and Naftali were taken, Ayah goes up to Rav Yaakov, slaps him on the back and says, I got it. I understand the whole thing. Not a word didn't understand. It's a kif. How fun is it when you understand? The beautiful thing about Shavik Havon, besides the learning, besides the seriousness of the guys and the, and the mentality that comes out, is the, the pnimiot. Like David was talking about the, the rooms where we sleep. The rooms where we sleep could have maybe, could have between four to 17 guys in a room. <laughs> it's no joke. And uh, from all ages, meaning, there are guys who are like up, up until you're married, obviously, but there are guys who are, you know, 24, 25, 23, 22, 21, 20, 18, 19. And so we're all then there together. And the room is like, a, if the yeshiva is like a big family, then the room is like the family within the family. You know, the guys in your room are, you, they may not be your best friends or you may not know them, you know, but they're the guys in your room. When you're learning in the Bimi Josh and you look up from your Savior for a second, then the first thing you recognize are the people who's in your room. Shabbat, we do Onig Shabbat, we do um, Tish, or we. Birthdays are always celebrated within the room. Sometimes we have dinners, we, have, we make schnitzel. It's a lot of fun. So, from that, like I can't say that I'm Ayah's best friend. That I can't say. And I can't say that. I'm the right representative from the yeshiva because truthfully after two years of being there the only thing I understand is how much I don't understand and pretty much just the guy who knows English. <laughs> <laughs> but I had the big school to be in Ayaz's room and I got to know him for what I did get to know him and we had some great times together and just to be a part of his life and to, to be a part of everything that happened is a big, uh, is a big schut. There's, there's a lot to describe about Ayal's personality, how he would do everything to the maximum, the, the idealistic piece of him, the not giving up for a second, the strive to always do more. The list goes on and on, and we'd have to stay here the rest of the night for me to really, like David said. But I think what, I'll continue to really the, the story from the time that it happened, because in my opinion that everything that happened since that Thursday night is just a clear example of who Ayah's personality was. Maybe that we could understand. I understood when it first happened. I was, it was after, um, on Friday, when the yeshiva goes to uh, Jerusalem to hear shiurim from some of the Gdolei Ado, some of the, the big rabbis of the generation. And I'm sitting in one of these shiurim, and I'm, after it's done, I, get a, I look at my phone, I get a text message from my father. It's an actual, it's like a police message that everyone was getting saying about Gilad and Naftali, that if anybody knew anything about them, they didn't get home that night, 
And they should report immediately to the police. To tell you the truth, naturally I didn't feel anything. I didn't know what to feel if, I, if there was a thing. Like the Rav said, I have four brothers and if somebody goes missing for a few hours, it's not, you know, besides for my mother, it's, Amongst the brothers were pretty calm. <laughs> so I thought, you know, it's Israel. The teenagers, they went on Tiul. The phone's off. They went to sleep with someone else. They stayed in Yeshiva. Could be a lot of things. But suddenly I start seeing people, you know, whispering to each other, mingling. So I, I go up to my friend Roy and I said, Maka, like, there's buses we gotta get back. Shabbos in a few hours, there's what to do. So he says, uh, it's not that simple. I said, what does that mean? He said, uh, apparently there's a third. There's two that are pretty much for sure, and then there might be a third. So he said, well, who's the third? He said, um, I don't know if you know him. He's, uh, he's actually new in the yeshiva. He's only a few months here. I said, well, what's his name? He said, I don't know, he's the, um, I didn't get to know him, but he was, he was a darker kid, a kid, you know, serious, you know, strong looking kid. Aya I said, yeah, 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 him, him. His parents said he didn't come home last night, they're flipping over the yeshiva, they're trying to look for him. We can't be talking about Aya because I just spoke to him yesterday. We were just joking around. He just, you know, punched me in the arm. I was supposed to explain to him something, you know. He asked me a question. I told him I'd explain to him on Shabbos. He helped me with something. It was just less than 24 hours ago. What are you talking about? He said, I don't know what to tell you, but... But if I didn't feel anything before, let's just say I felt even calmer afterwards. How do you explain that? Because if you picture yourself ever going missing, sometimes the first time, first thing that pops into your head is, who would I want to go missing with? And I knew that if I was ever to go missing or something was ever to happen to me, if I if I was there, then I could make it out just fine. So I knew, I didn't know who Kilad and Naftali was, but I said, Baruch Hashem that Ayaz with them, because if Ayaz there, it's going to be okay. So I had sort of a sense of relief. Of course, not understanding the seriousness of the situation. We make our way back to Yeshiva that, that Friday. There's Tehillim and the Bey Midrash. Suddenly the Bey Midrash is filling up more than I've ever seen it. All the Rabbanim come. Now, I don't know about the hundreds of people in this room, but I had uh, been very lucky that the only people that I've in my life had to really stay to Hillen for was my friend's friend or my friend's friend's mother or this person I've never heard about. You know, help for these people, soldiers. Okay, so they say one, two to Hillen. You start saying for someone you know, someone you, you know that the name of the you know the, the name that you're saying is someone who, who you personally have a connection with, and you just saw him, and you know that you need his to feel, he needs her to feel his right now. One to him, two to him, three to him. I'm getting messages from my friends who are in the army, saying that they're being sent to Somera Gush. They're being sent. All the elite units are being sent to look in the, the Gush area. So I know what's going on. I know the seriousness. And we know from, uh, from the past in Israel when the raid on Entebbe, we lost Yoni Netanyahu, Nachshon Waxman. Basically looking, looking for kidnapped uh, people are not, it's not uh, as good as an army we have, it's not always a uh, simple business. And I could see myself, and I could see, I could see my friends, or I could see that the soldiers are going in through every house, and I knew that they were, they're, they're going in, and they're going through villages, and I know what's in the villages, and I know what's in that area. And the only thing that could go through my mind, the only thing that I could, I could process is that every 
tefillah that I could say, every other tehillim, every word that, I, that comes out of my mouth, I just knew that that was going to be a make or break or difference if that bullet hit the terrorists or didn't hit the terrorists, if they found the, if they found the boys, if they didn't find the boys. Were they being hurt? Were they not being hurt? One tehillim, two tehillim, three tehillim. More, more, more. Suddenly I look up. I have to take a breath. I see my two friends. And I'm look and I'm I'm thinking to myself, like, Hashem, if this is if this is your plan, if this is if this is what you wanted, you wanted us all to come to the Big Midrash, I get it, you know, for Shabbos, you want everyone to come to the Big Midrash, you wanted everyone to start davening. I get the point. Let's go. The game's over. You know? You scared everyone. Everyone's everyone everyone understands that we need you. We got the point. Let's, um, let's make this all go away. I'm saying, we need a miracle. Suddenly I look up and I see my two friends. One of them is looking up to the sky and says, Isn't this? Isn't this? The other one's pretending to be Tiger Woods with his hands up in the air. I'm thinking that I just caused a miracle. I just asked for God for a miracle. And everyone's saying that there's a miracle. So I look to the side. My friend hands me his phone. On the phone, the message says, describing the most daring raid in Israeli army history, killing three terrorists, nobody's injured, saving the two boys. I'm thinking about what about the third? Next message, Ayah Yifrach was found safely in Petach Tifa on his way home. The story's over. We got what we wanted. So I'm thinking to myself, you can't be so selfish. If you're saying to Hillim and you're going to ask for a miracle and you finally get a miracle, so what are you going to stop saying to Hillim just because you got what you wanted? That's not how you were taught. So you say to Hillim to say thank you. So we keep saying to Hillim, we keep saying to Hillim. The rabbi who's saying to Hillim obviously didn't get the WhatsApp. So he's still saying to Hillim. Finally, after like five more to Hillim, I'm saying, okay, so thank you, let's go. The Shabbos. So I go to the back of the Mimi Josh and just by the look of my friend, my friend's face, could tell that uh, whatever I was thinking was the opposite was true. That Shabbat, whatever we usually do before Shabbat, we didn't do that Shabbat. Quick shower, white shirt, up to the beam trash to learn. A special thing about the yeshiva, and something that drives anyone who's there. It's not it's knowing that when I come out of yeshiva forever, however long I'm going to be there, for a year, two years, three years, I'm not going to be maybe a Tamil Chacham, and I'm not going to be a rabbi, I'm not going to know all the halakha, I'm not going to know the whole Gemara, and blah, blah, blah. But I do know is that every second that I'm there, every second that I'm sitting in the Bay Midrash, and every word that comes out of my mouth, it's for Am Yisrael. More light that brings to this world, and more light to bring to Am Yisrael and Klai Yisrael. There's a big thing that in yeshiva called Liot Ben Adam Klali. Klali. It's like turn into like a like a klali. Like it's a be a klali. Be someone who cares about the klal. Be someone who cares about klali sir. Don't be selfish. You see garbage on the floor, you pick it up, you see you see anything. Same thing with Torah. We understand that when I take my time, when I take two, three years out of my life before I go into the army, before it, and of course what I'm doing in the army, it's for the klali sir. And same thing that we knew that we wanted to do something for klali sir right now that we needed to start learning. Like David, also had to, um, was asked to do like some some media work again because of my English, not because of my anything else. So I asked naturally. I did not know what to say for myself. So I I called a meeting with the room. The room up until now, just to get a picture. You go into the room at night. You see guys not sleeping on their beds, and you guys see side guys, guys sleeping without sheets. So I asked my room, I said, okay, listen, the world's about to hear what I have to say. Who am I to now start saying, you know, what they, deciding what they should hear? Everyone gave their opinion, what, what they thought was Kadai. And then my friend took me aside and he said, listen, there's only one thing the world needs to hear. And that's that whatever message that these B'nai Avla, these terrorists were trying to send, Whatever thing that they wanted to do to us, you got the opposite. There's something about being 
Israeli, when I say Israeli, I'm not talking about people who live Dafka in Israel. Israeli comes from Bnei Israel, Bnei Yaakov. That's everyone in this room. Everyone in this room is Israeli. Whether you like it or not, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's the truth. If you're a Jew, you're Israeli. If you're a Jew, you're from Israel. There's a... Uh, there's an Edmo from Poland who, who once said that La Lacha, if someone asks a Jew where he's from, he has to say he's from Israel. Because that's where we're all from. So he said, there's something about the Israeli mentality, there's something about the, the, the software that God made us, something that's inside of us, that's built in, that can't be explained. But when something like this happens to us, when they try and take something from us, one from us, or they try and cause us to, like David said, the, the Ruach, when they try and hurt the Ruach, Nobody can explain it, but like the Rabbi said, naturally we come together. Naturally we want to do what's most natural. And what's most natural is for a Jew, when there's another Jew in trouble, is to come find the next Jew. And because understand, because one Jew is not enough. We need a minyan, we need ten people. Davening can't be the same, nine people and ten people. It's a huge difference. We need everyone. And the next day, after Shabbat, Sunday morning, I'm looking, I'm looking for all my friends in the Baby Josh and I can't find anybody. So I'm thinking, great, now, you know, now this and now nobody's, nobody wants to learn. So I go downstairs to look for everybody. I go downstairs a little bit more. I get to the office. I'm looking through the office, like, where, where can everyone be? I look in the meeting room. Suddenly I see 30 people on the phone, throwing, chucking papers from side to side, screaming at each other, running this hustle and bustle. So I said, what's going on? He says, we're arranging the, the davening at the Kotel tonight. And every Jew has to be there. Everyone. Chalidim, Chilunim, religious, not religious. If you're in Israel, if you're in you have to be at the Kotel. Everyone has to be there. So everybody was taking numbers of different yeshivot, girls schools, boys schools, Chalidim, anything they can to get in touch to make sure that everyone got to the Kotel. I was given uh, the number of one of the it's a, uh, a power player in the Haredi community. For those who, if you don't read the news, then kulakavod. <laughs> if you do read the news, I'm sorry, but unfortunately, like me, you know that there's no lack of machlokot and there's no lack of disputes in the in Israel and the Jewish world. Something we know how to do very well, for the best, obviously. And I'm thinking, oh, I'll give him a call and explain the situation. I'm calling him. First thing that comes out of my word, I'm from Shavei Chavon, Megi Zivan, blah, blah, blah. And he starts screaming at me. You have to understand, we're all davening for you guys. All the gedolim are saying to him, we're going to be there. Don't, you don't need to say anything else. We need you guys to be strong. If you guys aren't going to be strong, then we can't be strong. We're counting on you. Amisa needs you right now. And he's asked you guys to keep learning Torah, and we're going to keep learning Torah. And that's how it's going to be. I take the phone off, I'm looking at the number, just making sure that's the right number. <laughs> like, who are you? I mean, there's a year ago, there was elections, and this is not what I was hearing. <laughs> but what happened at the Kota that night was just, my masha, a little promo for what the Jewish nation was about to get ready for, for up until now, Baruch Hashem. I was there giving out to him. Because of the issue, we were, we were organizing the, the davening, and I was in the front giving out to Hillim, so I pretty much saw everyone who was coming. You see people with tattoos, and you see with not tattoos, with kippahs, without kippahs, dressed appropriately, not dressed appropriately. Everyone was there. Everyone came. One of the schuyot, one of the, I guess, perks if you could call it that, of being in the room of one of the three boys or being close to them. Like David said, it was getting to meet their families. Going to Elad to, to meet um, Iris and Uri, Eyal's parents, looking back on 20 years of life, has to be one of the most, besides for making Aliyah, which that was the best thing that happened to my life, if not the second, was meeting these two people, the Munah and the strength, that comes out of them. And Barkalis and Achedi, Frankert and Shao. If it was 
unclear that these three boys were obviously chosen for a certain mission in this world. It's very clear that these three mothers and their three fathers were chosen for this type of mission. I asked Iris, Iris had just gotten back from Geneva, she was at, which is at the United Nations, which is called the UM in, uh, in Hebrew. I asked her how was, how was the Echab UM. She, was, she responded, the UM Shmum. She says, listen, you're talking about, and you're pleading for three boys. Three boys who are coming from educational backgrounds, from yeshivas, from learning Torah. Which is, there's nothing more tamim, there's nothing more pure and nothing more innocent than learning Torah. You don't make money from it. You lose money from it, if anything. You lose your time. There's nothing more innocent than learning Torah. And she says, they're on their way home to spend Shabbat with their families. What's more natural than a boy just wanted to go home with his families? How many people could wish that their teenage boys would be on his way home in the middle of the night to try and get home for Shabbat, for his father's birthday, for, for Shabbat? And she says, you're pleading with him. And all you see in front of you is closed door, closed door, closed door, closed door, with one door open. She says, that's how it is. But she says, listen, if this is what he wanted, if this is what Akash Baruch Hu wants, and this is how he wants to play, then I'm with him. If this is how he wants, and this is, by the way, this is, this is before they found out, they found the bodies, and this is, so this is during, still during the time when, at least in my head, every, every vision that could have possibly go through, what could be possibly going through them, is imagine that anyone here, you could imagine the pain that she was going through, but here she was, smiling, Smiling, the mother of one of these boys, smiling and saying how much of a schut it is, a schut, an honor it is to be part of this movement, a part of this generation right now. She says, he wanted us to come together, we came together. He wants us more daven, we're davening more than we've ever davened before. People are putting on tefillin, people are giving staka, people are doing this and that. The soldiers, I was in because she was in Khabon, and Khabon was where they were searching for, for the most part. So I see all these soldiers, and you see the, the fire in their eyes, the burn, and these aren't soldiers, these aren't the fanatics, these aren't the right-wing fanatics, you know, who, who just, you know, for whatever reason, they want, they want to do what they want to do. We're talking about leftists from the left, from the most non-religious of the most non-religious. People who just found this fire inside of them, they're going to flip over every stone, they're going to go into every house, they're going to go into every room, no matter what's behind that door. With the most passion, my rabbi lives in Kirat Alba, which is right next to Chavon, right next to, right next to his apartment building. There was uh, two tzvatim, two um, units, two teams of units from Duvdevan. Duvdevan is one of the big counter-terrorist units. And he was inviting them in to, to shower, to eat. And one of the boys, he approached my rabbi and he said, listen, I'm as left as they come. I'm as most non-religious as they come. I'm from a kibbutz up north. Me and you have nothing in common. Let's put it this way. He says, I would never think about talking to someone like you. You live in Kiyot Aoba, you know, you're who you are. He says, but let me tell you something. You're a good guy. You guys are good people. After the three weeks that they were searching, the party that Duv Devan, the unit which is basically based in Kiyot Aoba, gave to Kiyot Aoba, they went around posting notes on each door in the Kirya. They were playing music as they were leaving, screaming on the, ramp, on, the, on the loudspeakers how thankful they were of them. The soldiers saying thank you back to the community. I spoke to, I spoke to Uri, Ayah's father, and he was saying to us how he was screaming at Shimon Peres, said, Shimon, the world loves you. Start screaming out. Scream to the world to start helping us. So Shimon Peres said, listen, I could start screaming if you want me to start screaming, but they're not going to listen. You guys are Jewish and you have to remember that. The world's not listening to you. He says, but I will tell you one thing. For as long as I've been around in Israeli politics, and forever as long as there's been Israeli politics, there's been Shimon Peres. And for as long as there's been Shimon Peres, there's been Israeli politics. <laughs> he said, I've never seen anything like this. 
not the Six Day War, not the Yom Kippur, not the day we got independence. Nothing I've seen has compared to what I'm seeing right now. That's coming from him. One, before we left the house in Elad, so Iris left us with one, with one message. She said that, she said, listen, we could always ask ourselves why. We could always ask ourselves, Lama, 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 Lama. But if you take a second and you put a little chup chik before, between the Lamin and the Memhe, the Lama becomes Lema. Lema, Lama becomes why, Lema becomes for what. So there's a time when we stop asking ourselves why and we start asking ourselves for what. She says, for what am I here? For what was I chosen? For what was my son chosen? For God knows what he's, they're doing to him right now. But why him? Why us? And what are we supposed to do about it? She says, we're getting ready for everything that the Mashiach needs. She says, the Mashiach is ready to come. She says, I see it. All I need is the Beit Mikdash to come down from the sky. We're perfect. We're davening. We're together. Staka. Forever... Anyone who thought in the world, or at least myself, someone who, who understood what the kind of achtu was going on, what kind of magnitude, everything. For anyone who thought that it was going to be over, and that we got into sort of a peak, and that it was only going to go down from here, because you know, once, once they found the bodies, and they're, going to, they're going to start throwing mud at the police, and they're going to do this, and then this, and we're going to, you know, this guy and that guy, the way we usually do. How wrong were we? How wrong was that? Ami Yisrael only got stronger. Not only did we get stronger, we got even more together. If we weren't together before, we were together now. When the war broke out, the amount of soldiers who are calling up to go down, Americans who, who left the army and that have no responsibility to go there now, going, flying themselves in. If you go to Sawoka with the, the army hospital where they keep all the Ptuim, the, the injured soldiers, I was walking through, I walk into the room with two soldiers there. You see, piled up is a hundred bottles of drink. And they're gonna have to stay there the rest of their lives just to finish that. God forbid, but that, that's, the, that's the case. Another guy walks into the room, 10 pies of pizza. Other people just throwing food around. It's like, the whole, and the whole hospital's like that. You can't move, it's a, it's a carnival. Everyone's bringing their dish, everyone's bringing this. One of the, uh, saf the Moroccan saftot came up to me with like whatever the, the Moroccans make, the sfinjim, the um, doughy, delicious, whatever it is. And I, I'm like, I'm not a soldier, I'm just a yeshiva boy. Like, she says, no, but you're coming here to the chazik, the soldiers, and if you're coming to give strength to the soldiers, then I have to give strength to you, because you're making a mitzvah, that means I'm making a mitzvah. I'm like, what's going on here? She says, no, it's a big halakha, you have to, I have to. How could I not? When we go to war, something that I understood recently, when Israel goes to war, when we, we go in and we, we start losing 50 something soldiers. And it's not just because, you know, for those who say it's for security reasons, for security reasons. But the fact is that when there's people who want to prevent us from doing the lima, the for what? For what would we put as a Jewish people in this world? And when there's people who don't agree with that and don't want us to bring that sort of light to the world, so that we need to destroy and that we need to protect. We need to protect the right to bring that light to the world, the way we're doing, the way we're continuing to do, the way we have been doing for the past six weeks, seven weeks, whatever it is, the way we're going to continue to do. This is not the side of the Jewish people, you know, the, the pretty side of, of, of being Israeli, the pretty side of, you know, Israel right now. Anyone who goes to Israel says, oh, well, it's, you know, just wait or go into the Knesset, you'll see the real story. The fact that we have achdut is the most natural thing that we have in our Jewish people. Achdut is the most natural being of the Jewish people. That can't be ignored. That, that's... The most legitimate thing for a Jew to be is achdut. To want to get closer to God is the most natural thing. The way a son wants to get closer to his father, there's nothing more natural than that. 
There's nothing more natural than a boy going home for Shabbat. Same way the Jews want to come together. That's natural. That's who we are. We're at the bottom of the hill. People say that, you know, we, we've gotten to the top. I like to think that we're on the bottom and now we're starting to go up. Because now we are who we are. I called up Bibi Sifach before I came to America and explained to her that I was going to be speaking before all the good Jews of America, all the good Israelis of America. And I asked her, you know, you're the, you're the mother, they should really be hearing what you have to say. She says, yeah, but I don't know English, so she asked me to speak before her. So I asked her, what, what should I say? She said, she says, Truthfully, I don't know what to say. What I do know is there was one Yom Atzmut, and Yom Atzmut, everybody, everybody has a barbecue, and everyone, you know, his family goes on a on a trip or whatever, or whatnot. She says that Yom Atzmut that Ayal didn't show up. Ayal didn't show up because where was he? Because he had recently bought in hundreds of flags, Israeli flags, and he went to Tel Aviv, to the heart of Tel Aviv. And he was handing out flags to everyone who he saw on the street. Because he wanted everyone to know that on Israel Independence Day, that they have a state. They have a Jewish state. And it's theirs. And they're a part of that. He was in 10th grade. So she said, tell them that story. That explains who I was. He loved everybody. It didn't matter who he was handing the flag to. If he was a Jew, if he was Israeli, it's the same thing. Doesn't matter. Says that's what they need to learn. That's what we need to learn. That's who was taken from us. Him with Gilad and Aftali, like we just heard. Those are the type of boys that Hashem takes from this world. Because those are the type of boys that we have to learn from. We have to understand who, what we had. That really concludes really what I um, thought about, had to say. It was then made a word to me, someone a lot wiser than me told me that. He said, another thing about this whole achdut thing that everybody's talking about, that everyone's feeling and everyone's feeling more connected. He said, it's very easy to feel achdut and very easy to feel this hitchaskut when Israel goes to war. He said, as soon as the war is going to over, be over, Bezat Hashem. And now we're going to start looking for who to, what to do and where to look and where to get our strength from. So he says, make sure that you know, he's speaking to me, that even when Israel is not at war, that we have to stand by Israel and we have to stand by who we are. There are people who are given guns to defend Israel. But those who weren't given guns to defend Israel have much other powerful ways to defend Israel. There's the yeshivas who have the, the Torah and anyone, the Tehillim and everything. But there's a big responsibility that when the mud starts getting slung on both sides, that we stand by, that we stand, that we take what we have today, that we take everything that the mothers have given us, that Gilad, Naftali, and Ayal gave to us, and the soldiers who are giving to us the security and the the, the ability for me to come here and speak before you and for us to live here to make sure that it doesn't go in vain and that we continue what we started we understand that there's a there's a forward, there's a schut to be in this generation because we were chosen us specifically those who are in this room and those who are not in this room to be a part of this movement to be a part of this achdut it's not by chance So, without the shame, just to continue the, it's an honor, like David said, to come to a place like this. As hard as it is leaving Israel, as hard as it is knowing that your brother and lots of friends who are who are down there, and to leave Israel under such circumstances is not just just to leave Israel, even when it's at peace, is hard enough. But when to leave a certain situation like this, it's even harder. But to come to a place, a community like this, to see the people who are coming out and spending their nights for something like this, just to hear to Two boys who they never heard of speak before them. And I'm sorry if we took too much time. Even Jews in Israel like to talk too much. It's, it's a common thing. <laughs> but but it, 
it's not only a schut, it was only a schut for me to get to know Ayal and to be in his room and to learn in Chavon and uh, to be a part of the whole, everything that happened. But it's a schut to be here tonight. It's a schut to see people come out. And it's a schut to tell me that, for me to tell you that you're Israeli and that I look at you like Israelis. We have to work on the Hebrew, but... <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> but I know that one day, much in the near future, we'll all be in Israel. We'll all be there. And we'll look back and we'll say, thank you to Ayal, Gilad, and Aftali for bringing us here tonight, for bringing us together, for saving us, for saving the people in the south from those deadly tunnels, and for bringing us here tonight. It's important to know what goes down there. Without knowing really what goes down there, not listen to the press, but to really understand what goes down there, really understand the real miracles that we've had, and the real schut that is to, to, be, to be where we are today. As the Shem only continue this way. We're going to conclude. We're going to conclude the Askara with two capitals of the I'd like to invite Rabbi Vernon to say the first capital, Rabbi Lieberman to say the second. Mishaberch for Sahal. Everybody should please rise, and then the Kel Malay by Rabbi Pearl. Psalm 121. Yisrael. <laughs> Aronai Shomrach, Aronai Tzilch, Adyad Yiminecha. Yomam Hashem, Eshlo Yakeka, V'yareach Balayla. Aronai Yishmor, Chomikol Ra, Yishmor, Nefshecha. Aronai Yishmor, Tzedek Havoecha, Meata, V'yar Olam.
Tachas Kanfei Ashechinam Bemalos Kedoshim Utaurim Kezohar Arakiya Mazahirim Es Nishmos Hakedoshim Eyal Ben Uriel Gilad ben Ophir, Yaakov Naftali ben Avram, Shenir Tzachu, Al Kedush Hashem, Babu. Shall call a call Hakodos has Besides, <laughs> <laughs>